Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into the video, I wanted to go ahead and address my hair. I know I've been dyeing it a lot. No, I'm not going through some sort of midlife crisis or I guess quarter life crisis, but I've pretty much just always wanted pink hair and it's been a little bit of a journey to get me to where I actually like it. I've had a couple of different dye jobs that I haven't necessarily loved. So I've been kind of going through the process of fixing that and then, you know, figuring out where I want the pink and how to blend it. And I'm finally at a place where I absolutely love it. So I'm probably not gonna be changing my hair for any time soon in case anybody was wondering. But my my hair is definitely not what you guys came here for. I just wanted to address that really quick, but that is not what's important. What's important is today's case. Now, today's case is yet another case that is definitely going to frustrate you and infuriate you. The way that everything in this case was able to happen is just unbelievable, and this was definitely a difficult one to research. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a massive thank you to today's sponsor, Blue Land. As I've said in many of my previous videos, I'm always trying to make changes wherever I can in my life to live more sustainably. I have reusable makeup remover wipes and I go out of my way to find hair and skin products that don't have harmful ingredients. But it's always been so hard to find cleaning products that don't have harsh and harmful chemicals until I found Blue Land. Blue Land believes that you should have it all in your everyday products. Their products are effective, convenient, and affordable. Their products are made with clean ingredients that are vegan and cruelty-free, and they're made without ammonias, chloride bleach, or parabens. They're also EPA certified, which means that the EPA has looked into every ingredient and make sure that it meets the Safer Choices strict criteria. I love using Blue Land products because unlike your traditional single-use disposable plastic bottles, all you need with Blue Land is their nickel-sized tablet. Stop paying five to six dollars for wasteful plastic bottles when you can switch to Blue Land and pay only two dollars for a Blue Land tablet. I got the bathroom cleaner as well as the multi-surface cleaner, and I was pleasantly surprised with how well they work. They also smell amazing when I'm cleaning, unlike normal products, which just have sort of a harsh and chemically smell. I also have their foaming hand soap, which smells amazing. All you do is fill the bottle with warm water, drop one of the tablets into the water, wait for it to fully dissolve, and then use within minutes, no shaking or stirring needed. My roommates were actually so excited when I got my Blue Land products because they just look so cute in our cabinets and they're aesthetically pleasing and my roommate is really looking forward to cleaning her bathroom with the new cleaner. I'm so excited for the offer that Blue Land has for my subscribers. All you have to do is click the link in the description box below and you can get 20% off of your first kit. You definitely don't want to miss this amazing deal. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down in my description box below to get 20% off of your first kit for Blue Land cleaning products. Thank you again so much to Blue Land for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Shanna Grice. Shanna Grice was 19 years old when her life was needlessly ended on August 25th, 2016. She grew up in Portsdale near Sussex in England. She was the only child to her parents, Sharon and Richard. She was described as being incredibly kind-hearted, always going out of her way to help others. She had been a student at Grove Park School and then had been living in a home in Brighton with three of her friends at the time of her murder. Her friends described her as the mom of the group. She would always make sure that her friends were taken care of. Her parents described her as lively and vivacious, and she was always social and always wanted to be friends with pretty much everybody. When she was in high school, she started dating a 20-year-old boy named Ash who worked as a carpenter. The two had a pretty serious relationship, even talking about having kids and talking about what they were going to name them. The two had dated for about three years, but they did have a pretty on-again, off-again type of relationship. By the time Shanna was 18 years old, in the summer of 2015, she got her first real job as a receptionist at the Brighton Fire Alarms Company. She was actually really excited about this job because it was a respectable job that would look good on her resume, and it also allowed her to start saving up the money that she would need in order to have her dream wedding with her boyfriend, Ash. However, while she was working at Brighton Fire Alarms Company, 
she met a 26-year-old man named Michael Lane. He was a mechanic at the same company, and he introduced himself to her, and the two started talking. Reportedly, there was an instant connection between the two of them, and Shanna started a secret relationship with him. So the timeline with the relationship is a little bit confusing because it was a secret relationship, so I'm not exactly sure of who knew what and when, but as far as I've seen, I believe this relationship went on without Ash's knowledge until April of 2016, and that is when she officially broke up with Ash to be with Michael. But Shanna quickly realized that she had made a huge mistake by breaking up with Ash to be with Michael. So by July of 2016, she had broken it off with Michael and asked Ash to take her back, and he did. But during the course of Shanna and Michael's relationship, as well as after Shanna broke it off with Michael, Michael exhibited some very disturbing and controlling behaviors. At the beginning of their relationship, he would always try to publicly show his affection despite knowing that, you know, she wanted to keep this secret. So he would send her flowers at work and make a big thing out of it, even after she asked him not to. She did report this to her manager at work because she thought that this was inappropriate for him to be sending her gifts while she was at work. But in addition to this, Michael continuously stalked Shanna literally every single day, which started way back in February of 2016, which she did continuously report to police. So in her first report, she stated that Michael had been hiding outside of her house and then slashed the tires on her car. Michael had also keyed Ash's car and then left a note on his car saying, Dear Ash, Shanna will always cheat on you. Happy New Year. So she reported this to police. So then the officer who took down this initial report of the stalking, he also spoke with the HR manager at Shanna's work and this person did express concerns for Shanna's safety. So her work pretty much knew that Michael was being weird around her and that he was showing these concerning behaviors towards her. The HR manager also told police that she had spoken to Michael about these concerns as well. However, at this time, police said that there technically wasn't enough evidence to act actually charge him with anything, so they ended up just giving him a verbal warning. But to everyone's shock and surprise, this verbal warning did not work. If you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. By the evening of March 24th, 2016, Shanna had returned home from work with Michael following her close behind. At this point, Michael had placed a tracking device on her car, which obviously Shanna did not know about. But either way, once Shanna got home on this day, I believe she was talking on the phone, but he followed Shanna into her house, which obviously caused an argument between them. Michael then chased her out of the house during this argument and then pulled the phone out of her hand, pulling her hair while doing so. The fight between them was bad enough that a car that was driving by had stopped to ask Shanna if she was okay and then picked her up from her house and drove her over to Ash's house. This assault was then reported to police and Michael was arrested on a suspicion of assault. The next day, police showed up to Shanna's house where she was with Ash and his family because they had all been over just providing her comfort and support after this entire assault happened. So going against their good practice guidelines, so basically something that they're not supposed to do, the officer went ahead and interviewed Shanna while she was still in front of Ash and his family. In this interview, Shanna told police that she had been friends with Michael, but she was not involved in a romantic relationship with him, which obviously we know is not true at this time. So like I stated earlier, at this time, Ash did not know about the relationship relationship yet, so obviously she didn't want to admit it in front of him and his family, and that's exactly why police are not supposed to interview her in front of anybody else. They're supposed to take her to her own area and interview her privately so that she feels comfortable and safe saying everything that happened in the situation. But either way, during this interview, she expressed to police about these other instances of stalking and then how that same day he followed her home and pulled her hair. Police went ahead and then questioned Michael separately, who did tell police that the two of them did have an on-again and off-again relationship. He admitted to following her, but denied assaulting her. And then to prove to the officer that he did have this relationship with Shanna, he showed the officer the text messages that the two had between them. And obviously this did show that they had a relationship. Police then went back and questioned Shanna about this entire thing. And she did admit that she had been romantically involved with Michael. 
but she continued to emphasize his stalking, harassment, and the physical assault by pulling her hair that he had put her through. Rather than being somebody that Shanna could feel comfortable reporting to, rather than holding Michael accountable for his actions and protecting this young woman who clearly was being stalked and harassed, because Shanna had a relationship with Michael and didn't want to admit it, I guess this entire thing of stalking and assault just didn't count. Because we know that there's no possible way that someone in a relationship could possibly be stalked and harassed and assaulted by their partner. It's just impossible, right? So Michael did not get in trouble for the assault. In fact, Shanna was issued a fixed penalty notice. Basically, they charged her and fined her with filing a false police report and for wasting police time, and she had to pay them $90. All because the officer had read the messages between them and they had kissing emojis. I'm literally not kidding you. I wish I was, but this officer literally said that because he read the messages and they had kissing emojis, there's no possible way that this could have been a real case of stalking and harassment. So even though Michael had pulled her hair, stalked her, hid outside of her house, slashed her tires, and vandalized Ash's car, none of that mattered because they sent kissing emojis to each other. It didn't count as harassment because they were nice to each other and Shanna continued texting him. Even though he did all of these things, it doesn't matter because again, we know that there's no possible way a boyfriend could ever hurt his girlfriend. There's no possible way he could be a creepy stalker. No way, because you know what? Hey, look, she sent him kissing emojis. He doesn't have to take any responsibility for his actions because she sent him kissing emojis. That's literally what the excuse was. I'm not kidding. So after this, Shanna had finally decided that she had enough of Michael, so she quit her job, citing Michael as the reason why. But shortly after she quit her job, Michael also quit. However, like I mentioned earlier, Michael had already placed a tracker on Shanna's car, so even though they did not work together, he continued to follow her. So I don't know the whole story behind why she continued to see him on and off, but she did, as I stated earlier. Like I said earlier, she broke it off with Ash that April and continued seeing Michael. Again, we don't exactly know why, but from the looks of it, from what I've been able to see, it honestly seemed like she was scared of him and she was afraid to see what would happen if she did break up with him. Clearly, Michael did not like the fact that Shanna was also seeing Ash, clearly by the note and by the fact that he had vandalized his car. So to me, it seems like that's why she continued seeing him. Obviously, he was very controlling, manipulative, and very scary. He was a very scary person to deal with. But what we do know is that after Shanna was given this fine by the police, you know, literally penalized for reporting a crime, Shanna's roommate said that she was really disheartened and she felt hopeless about the fact that nobody believed her. She was very, very frustrated. She was worried that because of what happened, that everything that she told police now would just look like a lie because she had this fine on her record. So to me, it was pretty obvious that the stalking and harassment did not stop. I just think she stopped reporting the multiple, multiple incidents because she was scared about not being believed. So there were no reports being made in the following months. But as I stated before, she did end up breaking up with Michael officially in July and she got back together with Ash. On July 8th, Shanna had Michael come over so that he could collect his personal belongings and basically get all of his stuff out of her house. But what she didn't know is that while doing so, Michael had stolen her house key. Then that next morning on July 9th at around 6 a.m. while Shanna was still sleeping, Michael had entered Shanna's home using her house key and then went into her bedroom and stood there just watching her sleep for about a minute or two. Or at least he thought that he was watching her sleep. She had actually heard Michael enter the house and walk up the stairs and then enter her room and she was really scared. So Shanna pulled over the covers over her face and pretended to keep sleeping. She sat there terrified, just listening to him stand there and breathe. Then she heard him say, quote, I wanted to see you and I knew you wouldn't let me in. I'm just not right in the head, otherwise I wouldn't do it. She continued to pretend to be asleep until she finally heard him leave. When she heard that he left, she got up and looked outside of her window and saw him walking back to his car. So throughout the entire time of Shanna reporting Michael to police, they basically just kept telling her that they didn't technically have proof that he was stalking her, so that's why they weren't able to actually arrest him. Well, before reporting her to police for him breaking into her house and watching Watching her sleep, she decided to call him and confront him about this and recorded the phone call as proof. I'm 
so uh, one question that's really bugging me. Why did you take the key in the first place? So I want to see you. Yeah, but um, that... Okay, I wanted to see you and probably talk to you. And I knew you wouldn't let me in otherwise. Yeah, but that's not good because it's putting us in danger. You could have flipped at any point. What about no, if... I wouldn't have uh, what about if I, I took... What about if I took someone home or something and then you came in and saw that I was with someone else? Oh, I just wouldn't have left. Well, you, but you left anyway. Yeah, I know I did. But it's just... It's just, I yeah, know, you, you had no right at all to... I oh, know I didn't. I oh, know I've got no right or nothing. I know that. Well, I, I still... I, you need to apologise to the girls because it is... It's out of order. Yeah, I know. I just don't want any trouble. Because the last thing I want is to put a person that. Yeah. Well, just as long you just just don't do it again. And if you come near the house again, I'd... Oh, I, won't, I won't come near the house again. I won't contact you again. Okay. I just I think that I think that's best because it's just going to keep on going around this vicious circle, isn't it? After the phone call the same day, Shannon did report Michael to the police. They were broken up at this point, so police had literally no excuses for not taking her seriously because now they weren't in a relationship anymore. So. I guess now he is able to stalk and harass her. When she reported him, she continued to emphasize just how terrified of him that she was and how uncomfortable this entire thing made her. As this was going on, Michael showed back up to Shanna's house to return the key, but by the time he got there, police had already arrived. So Michael was once again arrested and interviewed about this incident. Michael admitted that he stupidly took the key and he expressed regret for taking it. But once again, rather than being charged for stalking and harassment, breaking and entering literally anything, he was charged with theft. And that's it. So, once again, rather than actually being charged with stalking and harassment, or at least breaking and entering, he was charged with theft. And that's literally it. When later questioned, the officer said that he went with the lesser charges of theft because he was able to prove the theft because he had the tangible key. But obviously this isn't a very high charge, so Michael was not in jail for long before he was just released. But thankfully, thank goodness police gave him yet another warning to stop stalking Shanna because we all know that worked the first million times that they did so. After this, Shanna and her roommates changed all of the locks in the house and they just started to be more cautious and making sure that they kept everything locked up at all times. Then by July 10th, Shanna went to police with more reports of harassment. So she told police that she was receiving a series of multiple phone calls from unknown numbers and then when she would answer, there would just be heavy breathing on the other line. She told police that she was very scared and worried. She gave police the phone number that had been calling her, which she didn't recognize, but the police were able to trace it back to a landline number. Guess what? To everyone's shock and surprise, it was traced back to Michael's address. So clearly, Michael Lane was the one calling and harassing her. What a surprise. Now, at this time, Shanna had started a new job at a grocery store called Palmer and Harvey as a cashier. But working a job separate from Michael, obviously, did not stop him from following her. At this point, she did start to notice his car following very closely behind her. Then, anytime she would go out with friends to like restaurants or pubs, he would just show up and happen to be there. So it turned out that this entire time that Michael had this tracker on Shanna's car, he would show back up after dark every 10 days to change the battery on the tracker so that he could continue to follow her whenever he wanted. So she then called police on July 12th to report that she was now being followed by Michael to and from work. After this though, the police did take in the report but you are not going to believe this, but somehow Michael was labeled as a low risk for harmful behavior by police. This reasoning apparently was because of his lack of threatening behavior. So do you want to know what happened when she made this like millionth report? Nothing. Nothing was done. She wasn't taken seriously. They refused to help her and they did absolutely nothing nothing. They sent her a letter in the mail telling her that no further action was going to be taken on her case. There was a point that Shanna realized that police were not going to keep her safe. They were not going to protect her. Her reports were absolutely 
useless. No matter how many times she called, no matter how many reports that she made, no matter what she did, nothing was going to be done. So she started to rely on her family and friends to keep her safe. She told her family and friends that if they hadn't heard from her in more than a few hours, that something probably happened to her. She continued to get phone calls. He continued following her. He continued lurking around her house. Her friends and her roommates urged her to keep notifying police, but clearly by the several times that she had already done so, they did absolutely nothing. She was worried that police would accuse her once again of blowing the entire thing out of proportion. If you can't tell, this is a very frustrating case for me. I literally could not believe how this entire thing played out. I'm very frustrated talking about it. It's really, really getting to me. And this entire time, I can just feel so angry and so upset for Shanna. And I'm sure you guys are too, but that's why I'm kind of getting worked up if you can't tell because it's just that frustrating to me. So by mid-August, Shanna finally decided to meet up with Michael at a local hotel. They had spent a few hours together and apparently they came to the mutual decision that the relationship was officially over and that she was going to be with Ash. She left feeling satisfied and thought that maybe, just maybe, all of this was finally over. But she was wrong. Michael had apparently called a friend right after this and expressed that he was depressed after being dumped and he told the friend that Shanna was going to pay for what she did. After this, Michael had sent Shanna a formal legal letter demanding that she pay him back a debt of $250 for the money that he had spent on her throughout their relationship. He wanted the money back for all of the dinners, dates, perfumes, and other gifts that he had bought for Shanna, but he would not end up getting his debt, I guess, that she owed him. Now, the night of August 24th, 2016, Ash had slept over at Shanna's house, but he had to leave for work that next morning on August 25th at around 7 a.m. He said that the two had woken up, that they kissed, and that he said goodbye and left for work, closing the door and Shanna locking it behind him. The two had plans for that evening to meet up after each of them got off of work. They also had plans to attend a family member's wedding that following day. However, that morning on August 25th, Shanna did not show up for her work shift. This was very out of the ordinary for Shanna. She was usually very timely and reliable. So about three hours into her shift, her manager at the grocery store called Ash to see if he knew where she was. And right away, Ash knew that something had to be wrong. So Ash immediately called his dad, Ian, to see if he could go to Shanna's house to see if she was okay. Also, as soon as this happened, Ash also jumped into his van and headed over to her house as fast as he could. I assume at this point that he had called his dad because he probably was just able to get to her house a lot quicker than he was. When Ian got to the house at around 9.45 a.m., he immediately saw smoke coming from the house and the fire alarms were blaring. When he walked closer, there was a bloody footprint on the front porch. Then when he entered the home, he saw that there had been a small fire started within the house. Then he went over to Shanna's bedroom door and he actually was not able to open the door because it had been wedged shut with a piece of cardboard. So after trying to push the door open and was unable to, he went back outside for some air because again, the house was on fire. He then went back in and pushed it even harder and finally made it inside of Shanna's room. And to his absolute shock and horror, he found Shanna laying on the bed, covered in blood. She had been murdered. At the time, her roommates had also left for their jobs, so of course, Ian immediately called police, who showed up shortly after. They came over and taped off the scene, and forensic investigators then entered the home to take a look at the scene. They determined that she had been murdered, of course, in her bedroom that morning, and then whoever did it had moved her body to the bed afterwards. They also determined that the fire was most likely purposely started by the perpetrator after pouring petrol all over her room. Room. They also found that her bank card was missing. Of course, after this, Shanna's body was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner determined that her throat had been slit. 
she had a deep wound in her neck, which measured about 10 centimeters in length. Of course, police started interviewing everybody in Shanna's life. This included her boyfriend, Ash, who did confirm that he had been questioned by police. They also questioned Michael Lane, of course, who had a very interesting story to tell. So initially when police questioned him, he did not admit right away that he had gone to Shanna's house that morning. He told police that he'd actually left his house at around 8 a.m. that morning to go to work, but police confronted him with a CCTV footage that showed him walking near Shanna's house at 7.29 that morning. His car was also seen driving in the same area between 7.36 and 8.12 a.m. Now, the medical examiner had ruled that her time of death was sometime between 7.30 and 8 a.m. Shanna had received a text message to her phone from a friend at 7.42 a.m. that morning, but she had never opened it. Police say that this is most likely because she was deceased at the time, so that is why she wasn't able to open the text. So, when Michael was confronted with all of this evidence that clearly showed him near Shanna's house near the time of her murder, he admitted that he was at her house that morning, but he maintained that he had nothing to do with her murder. So his story was that he drove his car past her house that morning and he saw that her car was still in the driveway, which he thought was weird because he knew that she should have been at work. So he went to her house and noticed that the front door was half open. So he entered the house and he saw that her bedroom door was also left half open. This is when he saw her body in her room slumped up against the bed, still wearing her nightgown and there was blood all over her body, the floor, and the bed. He said that he could tell that she was dead. He also added that he didn't see a fire and he didn't see any sign of petrol being poured anywhere in the house at that time. But instead of calling 999, which for US viewers is England's version of 911, he left and went over to a McColl's convenience store to go and get a lottery ticket. When he was asked by police why he left and didn't call, he said that he had just never seen a dead body. He said that he was scared. He said he was in shock and just didn't know what to do. He said that he got scared that if he stood there for too long in the house, that police would show up and that they would think that he was responsible for the murder. So at about five, um, sorry, 9.45 yesterday morning, uh, Shana Grice was found dead in her bedroom. Tell me what happened to her. Well, when her body was found, it was clear that someone had assaulted her and they'd tried to set fire to her body. So tell me what you know about what happened to her yesterday. I don't only know what I've been told since being in here. Okay, so having, having had uh, a moment, um, what do you want to tell us? You ain't gonna believe me, but that's it's up to you. In the in the morning, I did go to Shana's. After I'd been to uh, Valley Road shops, yeah, and I was, was seen going back, parked up. When I went past her road, her car was still there. Okay, which I knew was odd because she was made a bit of I knew. She had started work at half eight, and that was about the time. It was about 20 past eight, so I knew she would have had to have left for work. So I went. I went round, walked around there. The door was open. The front door was open. Wide open or unlocked? No, it was open. No, it wasn't wide open, but it was like half. Okay. Half open. So I went in there. Her, her bedroom door was open, half open again, and she was on the floor. Tell me about your thought process then, about what made you think, right, rather than just calling the police in the ambulance, I'm going to just leave. Because I was scared. I didn't know what... I'd never seen a dead body before. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know... OK, so let's, let's, so let's go with this idea that you're scared. Talk me through that. What were you scared would happen? Well, the police would turn up and think that I did it. So then after getting his lottery ticket from the convenience store, he returned home without mentioning anything about this to his family because apparently this didn't seem to be very important information to share with anybody. 
He apparently had just found his ex-girlfriend who he was absolutely obsessed with dead in her room and he didn't think to mention it to anybody. He then took a shower when he got home and then scratched off his lottery ticket to see if he was a lucky boy that day. But apparently this is when he noticed that there was blood on his white shoes which had gotten there not because he murdered her but because he had just stumbled upon her body. But by that point he started to hear police sirens so he panicked and instead of turning himself in or doing anything, he decided to hide his shoes outside on the road, and then he also hid his shirt in a panic. After all of this, he then went to the dentist to get some work done. I'm laughing because it's just so casual how he went about all of this, and he was just expecting everybody to believe him. So then after this, after his dental work, because he had to get that done, police finally arrested him and that is when he was questioned before he was ultimately charged with Shanna's murder. Crazy, I didn't know that murdering your partner counted as doing something wrong against them because she did choose to date him. She did send him kissing emojis, so I didn't know that you couldn't murder them. I didn't know he would get arrested for that, honestly. I'm, I'm surprised, I'm very surprised. I thought that since they were dating, that he could do whatever he wanted, right? And that's what they said earlier. It turned out that the night before the murder, Michael had went to a local supermarket and he was caught on CCTV footage buying some petrol. Then on the morning of the murder, on August 25th, 2016, Michael went over to Shanna's house and then waited outside until he saw Ash and her two roommates leave. Once he knew that she was alone, he then entered her house and then took a knife from her kitchen and used that to slit Shanna's throat. He then used the petrol that he bought the night before for and attempted to burn down the house and destroy all of the evidence, which obviously he did not do very well. He then took her debit card and walked out of her house. And then another CCTV camera picked him up walking towards an ATM. And then it showed him withdrawing $60 from her bank account. So the trial for Shanna's murder started in March of 2017 and Michael entered a plea of not guilty. He was being represented by defense attorney, Simon Russell Flint, who argued that the two had a very consensual relationship and there was no evidence of any violence towards Shanna. But the prosecution argued that Michael was obsessed with Shanna and this showed through his eight months of continuously stalking her. They argued that when she officially broke up with him, she made it clear that she was not going to be getting back together with him and that at that time, he could not handle it. And he decided that if he couldn't have Shanna, that nobody could. So obviously we know about all of these endless reports that Shanna had made to police on the numerous instances of stalking and harassment but the prosecution brought forward even more evidence that pointed towards him being responsible. So the prosecution told the jury about how Shanna's blood was found on Michael's shoes and his shirt, which again, he admitted to hiding in his initial interview. Police did end up recovering those discarded items five days later, but the rest of the clothes, I guess, were not recovered. I'm not sure exactly what happened to them. Either way, the prosecution showed the jury the bloody footprint that was found on the front porch and showed that it had matched the shoes that Michael had been wearing that day. The jury was then shown the video of Michael walking up to the ATM and using Shanna's card because we all know the smartest criminals are gonna take their credit card and use it right after. Literally makes no sense, but thank goodness Michael is very, very stupid. Either way, the footage showed him trying to withdraw $250 because apparently, again, we know that she owed him, she owed him that much, but the account only had $60, so that is all he was able to withdraw. He got two $20 bills and then two $10 bills. Of course, he tried saying that the person in the video was not him. He did say that he knew her pin at one point, but he said that he doesn't know it anymore. But once again, he was confronted with the evidence that police had literally found the $60 in Michael's car in the same exact bills that had been withdrawn from the ATM. So it would have been a hell of a coincidence if someone who looked exactly like Michael stole Michael's dead ex-girlfriend's debit card and then used it to get the same exact amount of money as Michael did in the same exact bills. Then when Michael was confronted with the fact that he did in fact buy petrol on the night before Shanna's murder, he said that this was just a coincidence. He claimed that he had actually bought the petrol because he was considering killing himself because he was depressed after his grandfather became ill. So to me, I think he's just trying to get sympathy, trying to show he's depressed. He's the one that should get sympathy. He's the one that's trying to kill himself. 
didn't work. So Michael's defense came back and argued that Michael was just an easy target for police and that they considered him a suspect before a proper investigation could even take place. The defense also questioned why his DNA had apparently not been found on the knife that was used to kill Shanna. His defense also argued that Shanna was only making these reports of stalking and harassment to hide the fact that she was continuing the secret relationship with Michael. The defense talked about how Michael loved and adored Shanna. He said that if you read the text messages between them, you can see just how much they adored and cared for one another. He went on to say that these complaints of stalking have been exaggerated and blown out of proportion, which is literally exactly what Shanna's worst fear was when she was making these reports. However, after all of this came out with Shanna and her being murdered, it was actually discovered that surprisingly, to everybody's shock and surprise, again being sarcastic, Michael had a very long history of violence, harassment, and stalking against other women. In fact, there had been a total of 12 other women who came out to talk about their experiences with Michael. There were women who said that they had dated Michael and that during their relationships, he was very controlling and manipulative. Then there were other women who didn't actually date Michael, but they said that he was very persistent and tried to get them to date him and that he would send unsolicited, explicit pictures of himself to them. There were other women who they said that he he would just continuously harass them until they finally agreed to sleep with him. He would go to these women's houses and loiter around just like he did with Shanna. One woman in particular came forward to speak with the media about her very long history of harassment over the course of almost 10 years with Michael. She explained that the first time that she had met Michael was when she was only 10 years old and Michael was 17 years old. She was attending a camp at a community center that year where he was working and I guess helping out with activities. At first, she said that he seemed pretty normal, but quickly started showing some very strange and concerning behaviors. When they would have these campfires in the evenings, she would sit there and she would notice that he was staring at her the entire time out of the corner of her eye. Then whenever they would go on field trips at this community center, he would always offer to give her rides, like personally, like just drive her. Then after this, nothing happened for about two years until she was almost 13 years old and he was about 19 years old. At this point, she started seeing him driving in front of her home. Once again, she didn't think too, too much of this until he started waiting outside of her home and he would drive up and offer her rides, but she would always say no. And this was something that happened multiple times. By the time she was 16 years old, he would send her messages on Facebook and continuously ask her if she wanted to drink with him and go on rides with him. This really creeped her out, so she said no, and then she blocked him on Facebook. But then six months later, she got a friend request from him on Snapchat, and this came along with a message that said, he's sorry for freaking her out. Then after that, he started sending her messages asking her to sleep with him for money. Obviously, she said no, and she was really freaked out by this. But then he started sending her pictures on Snapchat of her own home with the caption, I can see you. She said that there would be times that after getting these messages, she would look out of her window and she would see him sitting there in his van outside of her home. Once again, this really freaked her out and she blocked him, but that didn't stop him. He made a new Snapchat and added her again and once again apologized. By the time she had gotten an actual boyfriend, she started getting messages from Michael saying that she shouldn't be with him him, her boyfriend, that she should be with him, Michael. He would talk about how lucky her boyfriend was for, you know, being with her, and it got to the point that he was so obsessive that she was afraid to even leave her house because she knew that he lived close to her. Once again, she emphasized that she was not interested in him and that she had a boyfriend, and finally, these messages stopped. She didn't report this over the years because, just like so many women, she was afraid of not being believed. Plus, all of this started when she was only 10 years old, so for the first like five years of this happening, she probably didn't even really realize that she could report this. Obviously, when you're that young, you kind of don't think, hey, I'm gonna report this to police. You just think, this is weird. I'm just gonna stop talking to this person. I feel like it probably just didn't cross her mind at the time to report this. But then in addition to this, obviously we can see that his behaviors did cross so many lines 
but technically police probably wouldn't have been able to do anything. I don't think anything was technically illegal, so they probably wouldn't have done anything to begin with. This woman has come out and said that she wishes that she had come forward with this story earlier, and she said that maybe this would have stopped him from doing, you know, what he did to Shanna, but rest assured, it probably wouldn't have. They didn't take anything that Shanna had to say seriously, so I highly doubt this would have been taken seriously either. He probably would have been given a verbal warning and told to stay away and, you know, find someone else to talk to. So it was and still is very clear to everybody that Michael had a very long history of stalking and harassing women from the time that he was a teenager. He was and still is an insecure little boy who just couldn't take no for an answer. So for whatever reason, he clung on to Shanna with his claws and when she broke it off with him, he decided that the only reasonable action to take was to take her life. Rather than just finding someone else to stalk and harass, he killed her. So after weeks of hearing all of the evidence that was brought up in court, the jury went into deliberation on March 22nd, 2017. They came back with a verdict of guilty for the murder of Shanna Grace, and he was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison. After his sentencing, Judge Nicholas Green said to Michael, quote, you have robbed Shanna of her life and you have caused grief untold to her family and friends. This was a cold-hearted murder. I have not detected in you any appreciation of the devastation that you have caused, nor have I detected remorse. In so far as I have detected emotion in you, it has been at a determination to do all that you can to protect yourself, and you have been the one person that you have felt sorry for. He also had some words for the officers who handled Shanna's reports of the stalking, and he said, quote, there was seemingly no appreciation on the part of those investigating that a young woman in a sexual relationship with a man could at one and the same time be vulnerable and at risk for serious harm. The police jumped to conclusion and Shanna was stereotyped. When further incidents of stalking occurred, Shanna did not complain to the police because she felt that her complaints would not be taken seriously. Michael Lane felt that if he continued with his obsessive stalking behavior, it was most unlikely that police would do anything to stop him. And he did continue, even though he had been warned by police to keep away from Shanna. Then her mother, Sharon, and her stepdad said in a statement to court, we're very relieved that the man who had killed our precious Shanna, our only child, will serve a long and deserved prison sentence. We brought Shanna up to respect authority and to always respect the law. We firmly believe that Shanna would be alive today if Sussex police had acted to protect Shanna on the many occasions that she complained about Lane rather than issuing her with a fine for wasting police time. Our daughter took her concerns to police and instead was treated as a criminal. I could not have stated it better myself. So after it all came out about how not seriously Shanna's reports of stalking were taken, the case was investigated by an independent office for police conduct. They later announced that one officer would be facing gross misconduct charges. Trevor Godfrey was found guilty of misconduct for insufficiently questioning Michael after he broke into Shanna's house. However, by the time this officer would have even faced these charges, he had already resigned from his position. So because of this, no further disciplinary action was taken against him. They also recommended management advice and further training for the six other employees who were involved in these complaints. The IOPC regional director, Sarah Green, said, quote, these circumstances surrounding her murder have understandably led to concerns being raised about how the Sussex police handle such situations. I would like to offer reassurance that we have made a number of quick time learning recommendations that the force has accepted, and we will make further statutory recommendations to improve how police handle reports of domestic abuse. PC Godfrey has been found to have committed misconduct for failing in his duties and responsibilities towards Shanna and for acting unfairly towards her by not further exploring the context of her relationship with Mr. Lane and by effectively reaching a conclusion without making proper inquiry. Those close to Shanna have testified that his actions affected her confidence in police and may have prevented her from reporting Lane's continued harassment. So it is nice to see that there is some action being taken against the officer who ignored Shanna, but it 
it's still frustrating that he wasn't even on the force by the time these charges came. I also saw that even after these disciplinary charges, Trevor Godfrey stuck to his guns and basically said, you know, these messages showed that there probably wasn't any stalking and harassment, so I don't even really think he learned anything. I still think that he's sticking to what he originally did and he's not really accepting any fault. I'm glad that they're saying that they're implementing changes in the police force and I really hope that it's made officers think twice about their actions in these situations. But it's still so hard to believe how badly her case was mishandled in the first place. I literally could not believe it as I was reading it and I'm sure you guys have noticed this is probably the most upset that I've gotten while talking about a case in a very long time. It's frustrating to see just how much you can report to police and not be taken seriously. It's absolutely terrifying to see that there are cases out there of women who are just continuously reporting the same thing to police and that they're doing absolutely nothing until she ended up dead. And obviously, that's when they have to do something, right? That's when a lot of these cases happen. A lot of these cases, the victim is ignored until they are found dead, and that's terrifying. And it really, really makes me feel for anybody who's going through something similar to Shanna. It makes me really feel for stalking victims who are not being believed. I think things need to be done way sooner, obviously. That's, that's obvious. Something needs to be done to every police force, though, to show that these victims should be believed. I would even go as far as saying that even if Shanna was making false police reports, it's better to be safe than sorry. Fully investigate it, fully do something. And when these continued reports were happening and when Michael literally admitted that, yeah, I broke into her house. Yeah, I watched her sleep. Yeah, I slashed her tires. Yeah, you know, all of these things were happening and other witnesses were saying like, hey, I literally saw him pull her hair. I saw how bad this argument was when her roommates were talking about how bad things were getting. When Michael's friend called to say that he said, you know, she's going to pay for what she did. Something should have been done. Something should have been done from the very beginning, from February. But she literally made so many reports from the months of February all the way until August. That is such a long time for no one to do anything. And it's just unbelievable. And obviously my heart absolutely goes out to Shanna, her family, Ash, and everybody else who knew and loved her. I know a lot of you might cast some judgment on Shanna, but she was just so young and she was just trying to figure out what she wanted in life. Her parents lost their only child and they've been through enough, so please only nice and encouraging comments down below towards the family. I truly believe that she continued her relationship with Michael because of how controlling and manipulative he was and how scared she was of him. I feel so sorry that Ash had to go through all of this and just when he thought things were finally going to calm down, things went completely out of control. It's absolutely devastating and it's just so frustrating at how preventable this case was. I know I just recently talked about the case of Lauren McCluskey, which is a very similar situation of her reporting things and you know, no one taking her seriously and nobody doing anything and it's just so gut-wrenching to see these cases, not even just in the US, this happens everywhere, clearly. It happens in the UK, it happens in the US. I'm sure it happens in Canada, I'm sure it happens everywhere that, you know, young women are reporting these things to police and they just don't do anything. Again, it's gut-wrenching, it's really sad to look into, but I feel that part of my duty of having a true crime channel is to spread awareness about these types of cases and make people know that these need to be taken seriously. Believe the victim and do something. Don't just leave a woman, a young woman, to fend for herself. That's unfair, and it's not your job, talking to police officers, it's not your job to just let women deal with this on their own. So if there's anything that I would take from this video, it's just believe victims, do something if you're in a position to do something, and stop letting these things happen. That's all I have to say. You guys know that I could sit here for literal hours just talking about how devastating this case is and how preventable it was, but you guys already know. You guys already know the injustices in this case. You guys already know how frustrated it is. I'm sure you're just as frustrated and upset as I am, and I'm sorry that I brought this case to you and made you so upset and frustrated, but this case needs to be heard. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. 
Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below to get 20% off of your first kit from Blue Land. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.